thousands that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant in the trial and the change This one thing remains This one thing Good morning. It's a lovely morning, and it's good to see each of you this morning. Um, I, thinking back to a week ago when I was up at the state park with our kids, similar morning. It was just lovely after uh, a not very nice Saturday up there. But um, very beautiful day this morning. Thank you for coming out to worship. Uh, for those of you online, welcome. Um, I am the third string this morning. So um, Pastor Rob is on sabbatical for, not that I'm counting, but 23 more days. <laughs> and then our student pastor, Rick, he's here today, but he was on vacation this week. And so you get the youth director again. Um, but it's, it's a pleasure for me to walk with, this, with you this morning in worship. So um, all joking aside, if you want to stand up, just kind of say good morning to each other. Don't shake hands. That's against the rules, you know. So just say good morning. And um, good morning, Rogers. Good morning. 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 Are we having any kids come up or not today? Yeah, I'm going to. Good. Our call to worship this morning is a uh, responsive reading that you'll see on the screen, and I think it's self-explanatory, so uh, I will read the leader, and you can read the all part. As we gather this day, each of us brings something to worship. We bring prayers of hope and prayers of anguish. We bring our voices, our offerings, and our questions. We bring our faith, tattered or whole as it may be. We bring all this to God and to worship today. We come to you, O God, to thank you for what is good. We come to you, O God, to cry out for what is wrong. We come to you, O God, to ask for help and restoration. We come to you, O God, with hearts and glad souls. 
When the world divides us, come Holy Spirit, make us one. When the world calls us orphaned, come Holy Spirit, make us a family. When the world leads us astray, come Holy Spirit, call us home. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill this place. Amen. Can we remain standing today, um, and we're going to sing our first song, Impossible Things. You hear the broken hearted, you set the captive free.
Amen. Sorry about that. <laughs> you may be seated. And Al, you can come on up for our children's message. And we're going to try and get back to a little normalcy here today. So if there are children here and they want to come up front today for the children's message, you can do that. We're just going to sit right up front here. Come on up. You can just sit on the floor right here. Come a little closer. There you go, guys. <laughs> I got a few things here today I want to talk to you about. Does anybody ever know why Jesus had to come to earth and have, why he had to go to the cross? Does anybody know why? Well, hopefully after this morning, you'll know why, okay? But when you guys were born... This is you guys. You're pretty pure, aren't you? You're nice and clean, and you haven't done anything wrong or anything like that. But, you know, as we get a little older, sin has a way of coming into our lives. And sin kind of changes us a little bit. Kind of makes us a little darker and a little more color through there, doesn't it? But you know what? God had a great rescue plan. He's seen that. And God didn't want us to be like that. So he sent Jesus into our lives. And he knew that Jesus would have to go to the cross to take these sins away. And what if Jesus came and took the sins of the whole world and took that all upon himself? And Jesus just took all them sins and took them away. That sin is now gone. And Jesus was able to do that because he had to go to the cross and he had to die there. But when he did that, he kept all of our sins there. He left them at the cross. And when he came back to life again, he brought us a new life. And what if we asked Jesus to forgive our sins? What do you think happens? If we ask Jesus to come into our lives, take away our sin, and make us pure again. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah, and that's all we got to do. This changes everything, doesn't it? Because through Jesus, we are able to get rid of sin. We could have never did this on our own. But Jesus came and helped us do that. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Bow our head and fold our, or bow our hands, fold our head. Dear Jesus, we just thank you for cleansing us, making us clean, and that we can turn our sins to you. And I just pray for every child here today, Lord, and we just uh, thank you for them. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Al. I don't know if I need to do anything else this morning. That pretty, sum, pretty much sums it all up. Um, talking with Al this morning, it's, it's fun to find these illustrations that not just, they don't just help the little kids, they help us too. Just remember, like, it is that simple. Uh, and, but yet that profound as well. So thank you for that, Al. We'll move into our message time this morning. Um, you can open any Bibles you have with you to Philippians chapter 3. Uh, I was going to read the whole chapter, and I still might do that, or I might stop after verse 14. So you just got to follow along and see where we end up. Philippians 3. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, 
and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for the Apostle Paul and his life and his journey. And I pray this morning that as we join together uh, in his words and take a deeper look that you would be speaking to us through these words. That anything I have to say is not from myself, but from you. And that anything that anybody hears is not from me, but from you. God, I praise you for this morning. I thank you for those who are here. Thank you for your promises that we can join and have hope in them. In Jesus, I pray, amen. I am going to assume that most of you have uh, heard of the Boston Marathon. I'm also going to assume that most of you have not run in the Boston Marathon, um, nor have I, shocker. But um, it is actually canceled this year because of COVID, um, and, but you know, it's been a big race. Um, I don't know how many years back it was, we'll remember it for the Boston Marathon bombing and all that. But about the Boston Marathon, um, I would say there's probably three different kinds of runners in the Boston Marathon, or maybe even any marathon for that matter, but I'm going to, you know, use the Boston Marathon as our go-to this morning. So you've got the people who sign up and they enter the race, and they're going to run a little bit just to get, you know, to say that, well, I ran the Boston Marathon, but they're going to check out shortly down the road just so they can get their little badge that says, I ran the Boston Marathon to get their participation award, right? So you'll have those. If I were to ever run the Boston Marathon, that would be me. Then you have people, uh, other runners, who run with the goal to finish, but maybe not finish first, uh, and, but at least to say, you know, I ran the Boston Marathon and I finished. They do whatever it takes to physically 
cross the finish line, whether they have to walk the majority of the race, whether they need to crawl across the finish line, maybe somebody comes alongside them, but they are going to finish. My favorite part about this picture, exemplifying crossing the finish line, is the man in the very bottom of your screen in black. He's like, ha, ah, yes, I did this, I made it, right? Then there's the last group of people who I would say are uh, the runners who run with the goal to win. They're not just going to finish, they want to win. And in order to run a race that way, you need to um, train, you need to put in extra time, you have to have a mental game and a physical preparation for that, and they run with one goal, to cross the finish line first. So there's those three kinds of people, but then there are sometimes these others, very rarely have I heard about them, but they sneak through, and um, I don't know, has anybody here heard of Rosie Ruiz from 1980? Some of you were not alive at that time, neither was I. Um, Rosie Ruiz, she was the female winner of the 1980 Boston Marathon. Um, and she cheated. She um, actually was kind of towards the end of the race and she came out of the crowd and just started running as if she had been running the entire race um, and finished first. And she had this whole saga that made it look like she had, you know, just put in all this energy and time running the 26 miles, um, but she did not. And people had suspicions about it, but they couldn't really prove for sure, you know, there wasn't any evidence for sure that she wasn't registered. And she made up this story that, <clears throat> Uh, well, you know, my short hair probably looked like a man, so you just overlooked me, and that kind of stuff. But she won. And if you Google her or go on YouTube, you'll see her in uh, media interviews, and she, uh, somebody asks, well, what would you do if we took your title away? And she fumbles around, and then all of a sudden she starts crying um, because, you know, well, I don't know what I would do because, you know, she won that. So... Rosie, we're going to talk about her a little bit more at the end of our message today, but she lived a lie and fooled many into believing it. So hold on to this running and racing idea, and uh, we'll come back to that. But for now, we're going to spend some time um, just in, in chapter 3 of Philippians. In this chapter, uh, scholars have broken it down in, in many different ways. And so the way that, that was easier for me to make sense of, to keep it simplified, was there's three different sections. In verses 1 through 3, we have Paul's warning. He's um, um, going to be talking about things to be careful of. In verses 4 through 6 is Paul's testimony. And then in verses four, or 7 through 14, you'll have Paul's goal. So in the first three verses, Paul is warning the Philippians to be careful of, if you look at the text, the dogs and the evildoers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he is talking about the radical group of Jews, the Judaizers. Uh, and they would, Paul would come along and preach the message of salvation through grace and faith alone. The Judaizers would come behind him and, and say, oh no, but you have to have works involved too. You have to do things. You can't just like keep it from here to here, you have to like be busy and doing things. And um, Paul was calling them out, telling the church of Philippi, hey, don't believe them. You have to um, have it in your heart, the faith and grace um, message. So um, Paul moves on to explain that if anybody thinks that they are golden because of their works, as the Judaizers were, were trying to explain, um, if anybody has any evidence that, you know, I am saved because of my works. Paul is, comes back and says, I have more than you. And so he explains in verse 5 and 6 all of the reasons that if it were about my works, I'd be the winner. And I'd be, you know, like I said, golden. So if you look at verses 5 and 6, you'll see this list. He was circumcised on the eighth day. So what that means is he was a genuine Jew. Some circumcised on the 13th day and so on, but if you're circumcised on the eighth day, you're a tr genuine Jew. He was a citizen of Israel. Uh, he was, you know, Israel, that was God's chosen people. He was in the tribe of Benjamin, which was a strong family lineage. He was uh, Hebrew of Hebrews, he says. 
That's like, I am 100% Hebrew. I am 100% Dutch, right? Or I'm 100% this. Uh, but he had no mixing and, and no other races in him, but he was Hebrew, pure Hebrew. He says, I was a Pharisee, part of the highest religious sect. My dad was a Pharisee. He said, as far as zeal, I had so much zeal that I was persecuting the church. And then lastly, he talks about his righteousness and that if it comes to, if it comes to, oh, I'm using my mic. That's what the problem is, huh? When it comes to righteousness and following the law, I was perfect, flawless. So, um, you know, he's basically calling out, don't anybody try and say you've done more or done better because I have done so much. But he changes his song, his tune in verse 7. He begins to turn the tables to explain that what he thought were gains are now losses. So what he had over here, um, circumcision, being of the tribe of Judah, not tribe of Judah, sorry, tribe of Benjamin, um, being in the Pharisee, uh, Pharisee uh, being a Hebrew, all these things that he counted as gains are now switched over here to losses. In business terms, all those things were assets. Well, not anymore. They're over here in liability. And um, all of those religious accomplishments had, that we just reviewed are now, what does the scripture say? Garbage. And in the Greek, it actually translates to manure. So it's not just like toss and say, it's like stink manure. It's, it's nothing that I want anything to do with. But what is it garbage compared to? It is compared to knowing Christ. Um, not just knowing him, and we're going to get into this a little bit, not just knowing him, but intimately knowing Jesus Christ. None of Paul's religious accomplishments brought him closer to Jesus Christ. In fact, they stood in the way. I feel like Aaron Parr um, explains this so simply when he says, no amount of external success or religious allocates can replace intimacy with God. No amount of external success or religious accolades or accomplishments can replace intimacy with God. No matter how much I read the Bible and get the information about what went on, no matter how many Sunday school attendance awards I get, no matter if I've attended church every single day of my life and have not missed a single midweek function, um, that's, that's not intimacy with Christ. Those are accomplishments, and there's a difference, and that's what Paul wants to teach us this morning. So Paul left behind all of those things, all of those liabilities that prevented him from moving forward into that deeper intimacy with Christ. Have you ever had to leave something, leave something behind, act like forget about it, not just like I'm choosing not to think about it, but literally forget it, in order to get something better than what you had? Simple example, I told my little ones this week after they were begging and begging and begging for a new toy, I said, if you want a new toy, you want something better, then you need to bag up all this old stuff and get rid of it before you can have something new. You need to forget about all the old stuff in order to make room for something new. Or maybe it's uh, changing jobs, leaving um, an old job for something new. Maybe it is a relationship, letting go of an old relationship and what was in order to create and cultivate intimacy in what lies ahead. And so there's many ways that we can think about what we've had to let go of in order to move forward. So now on to the goal. Um, Paul goes on for several verses, beginning in verse 7, explaining his goal, to know Jesus. Not just like I have explained, not just to know about Jesus, but to know him. His desire to know Christ is an ongoing daily journey. So these verses were written um, roughly 30 years after Paul's conversion. After Paul encountered Christ and recognized him as his savior, he's writing this book to the Philippians, this letter to the Philippians, um, 30 years later. And so if he is saying that he has been letting go of the past and has been looking forward for 30 years and has not yet arrived at his goal, 
this is an ongoing daily journey. It is not a matter of, you know, just, all right, I've met the Lord, I've, I've accepted him, and so I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm going to settle in here. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm just going to be comfortable where I'm at in my relationship. He's explaining it's a daily journey to continue getting closer and closer in your relationship with Jesus. So Paul is not telling us um, that it's enough to know about Jesus. Paul is telling us it is not enough to have a Bible in every room of your home. And he's telling us it is not enough to attend, like I said, every church function or um, those sorts of things. Paul is telling us that greater intimacy with Christ means we need to go deeper in our relationship with him. How do we do that? Verse 10 helps us out. Verse 10 tells us there's two things. The first one is knowing the power of his resurrection, and the second thing is participating in his sufferings. If you think about, um, and if you look at how he says, know the power of Christ's resurrection, think of it as the power of God flowing through you and me, just as the same power flowed through Jesus Christ in his resurrection. Now, can you even imagine that kind of power? I mean, you think of Jesus, he was crucified on the cross, he was beaten before he even got there, and um, lays dead in the grave. But the power that it would take to resurrect that can be ours. We want to know that power. I want to have that same power um, flowing through me to resist sin or to uh, resist addictions. And the power uh, to proclaim truth in the middle of pandemics and politics and persecution. That is not power from ourselves. You cannot give me that power. I cannot give you that power. Only God can give us that power, uh, which is also the same as that of the resurrection of Christ. The second thing that, we talk, that I had noted was to get to know Christ more intimately and to really know him. We need to participate in his sufferings. So, you know, I thought about that. Well, why would I want to participate in a crucifixion? Um, I feel like I could get to know Jesus by reading other things about him instead of, like, doing that. But what this is um, explaining to us is that one of the most intimate ways to get to know someone is to experience their pain. And I think we're, we're a people that have experienced and know pain quite well. Um, for example, you know, I can empathize. I could empathize and understand the pain of having a young child in the hospital. I can understand that. Like, as a woman, seeing somebody with a young child in the hospital, I can understand why that would be difficult and stressful and burdensome and it, it, there's suffering of sort. But until I experienced that pain, until I, it was my own pain when my baby girls were flown in separate uh, helicopters from Marshall to Sioux Falls, and I had to stay in my own hospital for four days, the first four days of their lives, you know, I, didn't, I wouldn't have understood that kind of pain until I have lived through it myself. It's, it's when I experienced it that then I got it. Oh, I know what this is like. We can think the same about uh, medical diagnoses. Until it's my family member diagnosed with COVID, cancer, Lyme disease, until it's my family member, I can understand and I can get why that's hard, but until I'm experiencing that, until we're experiencing that, I can't know it. And so Paul is saying, I want to know Christ's sufferings. I want to experience his sufferings in order to know him and in order to appreciate him more intimately. He continues to clarify that um, he has not reached his goal. And the point is that the only way he can get closer to his goal is getting deeper in his relationship with Christ by forgetting those things behind, leaving what is behind, and moving towards what is to come. 
you know, I, I think you all can probably think of some things you've had to leave behind. And I've had to leave behind some good stuff in my, to some of you, short life, to others of you, old life. Um, and I've had to do that in order to experience a deeper relationship with Christ. To help you get your, your thoughts fully about, have I done this, or can I, can I get to know Christ more? Here's some examples. Changing, um, from my own life, changing colleges. You know, I went to one college thinking this is where it's at. And this is where I'm going to learn all I need to know about the Lord. And after a year, I'm like, there is nothing here for me. I need to go somewhere else. I need to get closer to Jesus and learn more. So I went to a Bible college where I found out, like, I, did I even read a Bible before? Because I just didn't have a clue. Like, whoa, I can get closer by changing things in my life. Um, I've had to leave ministry before in order to get more intimate with Christ. I've had to end relationships, you know, reevaluating friendships, um, setting aside my own goals and setting aside my own plans, uh, which are all plans of the flesh. For example, Danny and I planned on having two children. Mm-hmm. It's funny, because that was our plans. Well, you know, God never gave us two kids. We had one, and then we had three. So set aside your plans and your goals. Draw closer and get more intimate with God. And then, of course, um, I left ministry, but then I left, you know, this is the oxymoron here. Left ministry to get closer and deeper with Christ. And here I am. I had to return to ministry to continue to grow and get deeper with Christ. Okay? So... You have to leave things behind and forget things behind, not because they're bad, right? Morning psychology is not bad. Emmaus Bible College brought me closer to Christ. Certain relationships were not bad for me. I just needed other relationships to bring me closer to Christ. Having one or three children was not bad. I need six children to bring me closer to Christ. So what are those things in your life that you can let go of and leave behind in order to go deeper and closer to your Savior. Looking back will not move you forward. What do you, you football players, or even just those of you who like football or whatnot, or even, you know, running races, what's one thing that would slow you down? Slow down the, the man who is... Um, running the ball to the end zone. Don't look back, right? You're gonna slow down if you look back. You have to run to the end zone with all your might. Or same in baseball. The, the Westland boys just finished their baseball season very well. And what's one thing you're always taught to do in baseball? You run through first base. You go. We need to run forward and not look back. We need to leave behind what was in order to move closer to Jesus Christ. And like I've mentioned, it's easy to get comfortable in one place. It is so very convincing to look at where we've been and to think, oh, yes, this is it. I'm good. I'm good. But Paul's message to us isn't about being good, and it isn't about getting settled in and comfy with who we understand um, God to be, and we cannot settle. We must be ever growing deeper in our experience of God because there is so much to get closer to and so much more to learn. So as I've explained in some of those examples in my own life, I'm sure you have many examples in your own lives um, when you've been comfortable for uh, months, years at a time, and simply settled in, but then the Holy Spirit comes over you, and he comes along and he says, come on. Let's get closer. Let's get closer to the goal. So what is the goal? After all this, the goal is to know Jesus. And what is the evidence that we're trying to get to know Jesus? We're letting go of what's behind, and we're pressing on. We're going to keep going closer. We're going to get closer and closer and closer until one day, as Paul explains and says, um, to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus.
So we've got to let go of successes that we're taking credit for. We have to let go of pride in a list of works that actually stand between us and that intimate relationship with God. And all the other things that, you know, I could stand here and mention for a long time. Paul closes verse 14 with winning the prize that God has called him heavenward in Christ Jesus. And and he follows with the remaining verses uh, through verse 21, encouraging the Philippians to follow his example, not because he's all that, not because he's been made perfect, but because his example is Jesus Christ. So now, back to our marathon, our run. If intimacy with Jesus were like running a race, how are you running? Is your mind set on earthly things? Are you just doing it to get that participation award? Are you like Rosie? I mean, you're not even running, you're just kind of pretending. And you're telling pretty good stories, and not even just to everybody else, but to yourself that, well, I can sort, I can make it look like I'm running. I can make it look like I'm getting closer to Jesus. Last week when I was camping with our kids, one of the best weekends of my life, um, we were talking about being authentic and uh, taking off our masks because, you know, Jesus didn't create masks, and uh, we're called to be authentic. And so that kind of tie- reminded me of Rosie. She had a pretty big mask she was hiding behind, and it didn't do much good for her. She actually died a couple years ago at age 66, I believe, not very old, and I think it was from cancer. Um, but she went kind of into hiding after all this because, can you imagine winning the Boston Marathon but not winning the Boston Marathon and trying to do that? I think that'd be difficult, but I think even more difficult is trying to be rosy in your race to the prize for which God has called you heavenward. So like I said, are you pretending to run or is your citizenship in heaven? And are you running to win the prize to have intimacy with Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, we want to know you. We have so much to learn, so much growing to do, and uh, to live as Paul has encouraged us. Not to live necessarily like Paul because he was the chief of sinners, as he explains, but to live like you because that's who he wants to be like. God, I pray that we'd have that same zeal as Paul, that we would want to be closer to you and that we would never settle for where we are. It's one thing, Lord, to proclaim you as our Savior and to be good with that, but there's more to that relationship that we can go after. Draw us near to your Son, Lord. Please help each of us to strain toward what is ahead in order to be called heavenward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is the normal time in our service where we would pass a collection plate and collect tithes and offerings, but of course with new guidelines, uh, you notice the basket in the back um, to bring your tithes and offerings to the church. Um, You can also use the drop box in the fellowship hall. Of course, you can always mail it in, and then there's the online giving options too. Um, So let's take a moment, even though we're not uh, passing the offering plate now, let's take a moment to pray over those gifts. Lord, thank you for the giving of your people. Thank you for the the leadership that you have put in place within our uh, congregation and this church who uh, use their wisdom and their discernment to um, best distribute these funds. God, we know that there are many needs. There are many um, people and places that we can give to. And I just pray that as we give, And that as the church receives, as our deacons disperse the monies that are given, that uh, you would be honored and you would be glorified with that. Thank you, Lord, for um, 
just providing everything that we need in exactly the time that we need it, Lord, according to your reasons and purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I go into a morning prayer, I neglected the announcements this morning, so I'm going to do that in a minute. Um, next week, you'll note in your bulletin, if you're coming to church, you can come at 9. You'll be early, because we're going to start at 9.30 next week. We're going to go back to that. So 9.30 next week, but, you know, if you like to be here early and get your seat, 9 o'clock, we're open too. So, but starting next week, we'll go back to 9.30. Um, I also want to, for those of you who are here or listening online, um, post high school barbecue next week. There's a note about that in the bulletin. Um, I believe Dory, you can contact her about that, or uh, the Mittendorps. That is for post high school students. So anybody who's graduated high school through, I believe, four years after, kind of like the college years. Um, hopefully, a, uh, just a new group, a new space for y'all to hang out and to be fed and just to fellowship with each other in your um, in the same age range, because that's often a, a section of folks that we overlook. Like all of a sudden you're a kid, and then you have to grow up, and you know. What, what do we do? So this will be a neat opportunity for you guys to get involved that way. And then I also want to highlight um, Eileen, or Miss Eileen, as she's called in our house, um, is working diligently for Sunday school. Uh, you've probably gotten emails about that, and if you haven't gotten emails, you can look in the bulletin. There's information about it there. Um, there's a few teachers yet that need to, a few positions that need to be filled. And um, also looking at starting Sunday school possibly in October. Is that right, Eileen? Okay, in October. So um, please just keep your antennas up for the Sunday school information so that uh, your kids can be involved. Please register them with Eileen. Send her an email uh, to get them registered so we have enough supplies and materials uh, because that is something that I know is missing. We missed that part of our ministry here at First Reformed, and it'd be nice to get back into that, and we want to make sure that all kids are included. So... Um, there's your announcements. With that, we'll go into our prayers and joys and concerns. Uh, first, our sympathy goes out to Robin Dory and the passing of Dory's uncle Alvin. That was last weekend. I believe the funeral or family service was on Tuesday. Uh, uncle Alvin Van Lan. Uh, Larry Cruz had gallbladder surgery on Wednesday. I don't know how he's doing. Does anybody? Okay, no news is good news, so he's doing well. He's home? Okay. Um, and then Sarah Krupke, as you've gotten the emails, is undergoing some tests for a mass on her uh, brain, and that's all that we know right now. There's just a lot of testing going on, so pray for that family um, as they go through that. As of right now, I understand Sarah's feeling pretty well. Uh, it's just that there's something going on, so pray for the Krupkes. Again, we need to continue to pray for Justin um, next week, uh, early next week. Uh, he'll have another appointment, and um, he's had a few rough days again. So let's just keep praying for the Browers. Um, it's been, I believe, over a year that they've had to be um, going through this. So let's continue to pray steadily for them. And then, of course, the others... Our uh, other announcements, or I'm sorry, joys and concerns are in the bulletin. Things I want to add, though, is um, thank you for your support for Impact and for your prayers over us last weekend. We had a really good weekend, my opinion. Now, ask the kids, who knows? But it was a really good weekend. And um, the picture on the screen is from that weekend, um, a few of our kids kayaking on Roy Lake, and it was just, it was just wonderful and beautiful. So thank you for your prayers and providing... Um, and contributing to that ministry uh, because the Holy Spirit was present. Let's turn to God and pray this morning. <clears throat> Almighty God, we're grateful for all that you've done for us in the last week and, and for all that we look forward to all that you will do for us in the coming week. And I pray this morning, Lord, over all of our concerns and our joys. Uh, Lord, we pray for the family of Elvin Van Land and his sudden passing. We pray for horsemen as they grieve that loss of an uncle and for the extended family as well, Lord. Um, I want to pray that um, you would be with Larry in his recovery from having gallbladder surgery. Lord, uh, some people might say that's a simple surgery, but recovery is never simple. So I pray for Larry, Lord, as 
He recovers at home. He continues to get stronger each day that you'd be with Henrietta as he's, she is there also, and um, that they would receive the support and the help and the encouragement that they need to uh, get through this time. Lord, we also pray this morning for the corrupt keys and the mystery of what's going on with Sarah and the small mass on her brain. Lord, we always hear that word and the mass, and we get worried and we get concerned. And I pray for the Krupkis, Lord, that they would just storm your throne and be bold and hopeful in the promises that you have for them. Whatever the test results show, we pray, God, that you would provide strength and you would provide that power within them to uh, get through whatever it is that lies ahead. And also, Lord, remind them that um, you are a good God and you care for them and you care for their family, even in the uncertainty of um, whatever the results will show for Sarah. God, we also pray again for Justin. Lord, we prayed, we talked this morning about knowing about knowing somebody and, and understanding and getting into a deeper relationship while we know somebody's suffering. And Lord, there are very few people who can know what Justin and Carrie have been carrying and carrying with them and going through in the last year. And God, we don't have shame in that, but we come to you because you know it. And you can provide for them power that we cannot. Lord, we, we pray for them, we love on them, we can serve them, we can give things, but God, we need you to intervene. We need you to provide the hope and to um, reassure them of your promises to them and in their lives. So God, just be with the Browers again this morning and in the coming week as they, uh, I'm sure, look forward to heading back to Wisconsin and meeting with the doctors and just be with them, Lord, to uh, provide the best care for Justin. Lord, we also pray and, and never forget about our um, community members and our family members who are battling uh, cancer, God. You know them each by name. You know each of their um, diagnoses. You know each of just all the details of what's coming up for them, whether it's tests, scans, treatments, waiting. And God, we give that all to you. We give each of them and their families to you. Lord, we also... I want to thank you and praise you for keeping our youth safe last weekend as we were able to go on a camping trip. Thank you for the ways that you showed up, whether it was in the beautiful space that we had, whether in the laughter amongst ourselves, in our joking, or whether it was in late night conversations in our tents, and even God through the storms that we got to um, experience. God, I pray for not just our young people, but I pray for uh, the body of Christ to become authentic with one another, to drop our masks and to reflect your glory and the splendor of who you are in our lives. You've called us to that, Lord, and I pray again for strength for our kids to do that and also for just all of us to um, put down the masks and to burn those and to accept who we are and who you've created us to be. And Lord, as we plan and gear up for the month of August and all that it holds as far as activities and trying to return to a normal schedule of sorts with our kids and activities and learning, I pray for our schools. I pray for our administration and our teachers. Um, I know there's a lot of uncertainty there, but God, we pray that we could return to what we call normal. Lord, our kids miss each other. Our kids miss our learning time and... Um, uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would uh, intervene, that you would pr uh, provide protection to our schools, not just from uh, coronavirus and other illnesses, but um, through, through all matters. We pray for safety in our activities um, and in our coming and going as we go about our busyness and being involved. Thank you for the opportunities that are available for us in this community and in our surrounding communities, Lord, to help us grow physically and um, emotionally. And I pray for even more opportunities for us to grow spiritually with one another as well. God, I give praise for this day, praise for our time this morning together. I pray that uh, we would go forth from here, pressing onward to the goal for which you've called us. 
heavenward in Christ Jesus. And it's in his name all God's people say, amen. As a reminder, after our closing song today, um, we will usher out from the back of the sanctuary and move our way forward. So how does that go again? The first shall be last, the last shall be first, all that stuff, right? So um, just be mindful of that. Um, and that's all we have. Okay. So if you want to stand, please, for the uh, benediction and closing song. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than what we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to, give him, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Our closing song this morning is not evidence uh, because it's a newer song and um, downloading newer songs is kind of not liked by the computer. So we're going to do an older one, but still has a good message for us in regards to um, knowing Christ. And it's called uh, In the Secret, or better known as I Want to Know You. Have a blessed week. In the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour, it's only for you, because I want to know you more. Every end of the side out of my way Cause I want to know you